Hello, and welcome to this webinar titled Case Study and Experience on Sanofi's and SGS's Implementation of BPOG's Leachable Risk Assessment Model, hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by Ken Wong, Deputy Director at Sanofi Pasteur. This presentation will be followed by Case Study and Experience in Extractables and Leachable Studies of Plastic Process Materials, a CRO Perspective, presented by Dijon Liu. Manager of Global Lead Extractables and Leachables at SGS Life Sciences. My name is Stephen Edwards and I'll be the moderator. Before we begin, I would just like to inform our viewers that there will be a live question and answer session after both presentations near the end of the webinar. Audience members can send their questions in at any time during the webinar via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. And we will go through these at the end of the webinar. Now please allow me to introduce our first presenter, Ken Wong is a Deputy Director of Process Technology Platform at Sanofi Pasteur. Serving as a Swiftwater Site Extractables and Leachables SME, but also provides E&L supports to all global sites. His 19 years in the biopharma professional career has ranged from R&D to development and commercialization to CGMP manufacturing support. For the last 17 years, he has specialized in E&L in a wide range of packaging systems, including lyophilized powders, oral liquids, creams, ophthalmatic solutions, transdermal, biosurgical delivery systems, injectable devices, and inhalation devices for aerosols, solutions, and powders. In the last 10 years, he has been heavily involved with the single-use technology and actively participating in disposable work streams of Bioforum's operations group the USP665 Expert Panel, and the LC Material Work Group. I will now be handing over to our first presenter. Welcome, Dr. Wong. Thank you. Forward. Okay. So today, we'd like to share with you the agenda here, basically, is to talk through the, the Bioforum Leachable Best Practice Guide in terms of the risk assessment model and the content in that uh, publication as well as how Sanofi implemented that into our internal practices and our experience based on our implementation. So the Bioforum Literature Best Practice Guide is actually published back in 2017 in March and here provided you a link where you can download this document for free. And this is the very first publication in the industry related to Literature Guide in terms of risk assessment and qualification approach to disposable systems. So if you do download this document, you'll see the three major set of information in the content. The first is the risk assessment. They provide you a list of uh, risk factors to consider in your risk model. It has a proposed risk model available for you if you'd like to use it. And then that is the tool for you to identify the literal risk of disposable system that can be considered further once you rank them up for additional study to qualify the disposable system. And if you do require additional studies, the study design considerations are also provided at the second section there that cover full range of the component that you use in your manufacturing processes. And then in terms of analysis standpoint, they talk about the analytical method consideration where you will have chance to evaluate for patient safety and product quality evaluation for the component as part of your final qualification of disposable systems. So when we talk about the leachable, our leaching assessment here when we deal with the risk model, we use risk assessment model and that's not the same to say is a safety assessment. So because when you do safety assessments, which means you know exactly what particular chemical you're accessing. So here we are more on a broader basis to evaluate the potential risk where we need to go deeper evaluation to find out the specific compound for safety assessment. So in, in the discussion here, the language that you are hearing is the leaching propensity we are dealing with where we assess the likelihood of unknown leachables from the polymeric manufacturing components entering the process stream. At a point where you end up in the final drug product at a concentration of concern. 
So that's the leaching propensity we are assessing. So in this assessment, we have to really look into the components and the process conditions where the risk will be potentially evaluated. So when we talk about risk assessment in the model, there are five risk factors describing the, the consider, for consideration. So one of them is the distance along the process stream. So this is capture where the component is used in the entire process train. And then the exposure temperature, which is where the component will be exposed to during manufacturing, as well as the exposure duration, how long it gets exposed to in the particular process, and the salvation power and also the potential penetration of the solvents into the in the polymer matrix. So this is where you use and what type of fluid contacts you come into and the matrix of the fluid. And then last but not least, we call the dilution factor is related to the proportion of the material of disposable system in your process volume. Okay, here you get into the actual table in the document. So this is the table provide you the guide. On the top, you see the five risk factor that we just described. On the left, going down is the rating where they break into four different ratings, one, three, five, and nine. So for a given risk factor, you they have a basically four cutoff. Take the temperature, for example, here, if they're considered near frozen condition, like minus two, is ranked at one. So if it's a go above 30 degrees C, you rank at nine. And the same go across the board to give you a different cutoff for different risk factor. And overall, they have some flexibility built in for this. You can adjust accordingly based on the very specific needs of your processes. And I'll share with you later on how we value that as a Melfi. So when we are putting it together with all the risk factor, you are basically can adjust them, as I say, by the end user based on your actual manufacturing. But then there's also a weighing factor for each risk factor. So the, the first one, the distance along the process stream will be weighted at about 40%, so it's 0.4. And then the other four are break down evenly, about 15% each. So once you calculated the score at the end, you have a, a range of one to nine. And then we divide that into three different categories of risk level, low, medium, and high. So once you are divided, well, sorry, before you're dividing, so the calculation is shown here in this table here, you take the value, the one, three, five, or nine for the component in the process train, you times the different risk factor, you add them up, and then you have a total score. If the score falls between 6.3 and 9, you'll be high risk. If the score between 1 and 3.6 is low risk. And that's how it goes. So now we are getting into the implementation, uh, <clears throat> the implementation of this risk factor in Sanofi. So first of all, when we look into this, we have formed a core team within nine major sites across three different global business units in early 2017. Our goal is to develop a unified risk assessment model on a global level so we can all use the same model across the board. Within the scope for consideration here is that every disposable system is in scope except the point of use final sterilizing filter, any multi-use systems as well as stainless steel system. In addition, we also invited an extended review team from IND, toxicologists, regulatory, and then other business units, since we have five business units also for review at the final stage. And we, when we do this, we basically put six representative bioprocesses that we have across all the major sites. And then to determine the proper adjustment we need to do for the final risk assessment model. And this model was finally approved in December 2017, so we have been using it for over a year now. So from 
at the end, basically, what we have done, based on all the adjustments across all the different processes, from vaccine, from biologic, and small molecule sites, and so on. So we have made five minor changes to the risk model and four major changes, which I'll show later on. And then we have to exclude the sterilizing filter. The thing that we realized is that it's a legacy practice. Regardless of what risk level, the expectation won't change, so we have to take it out. Otherwise, we can make it work. So, so far, it's been working well. Uh, at the time of the initial preparation of this slide was five projects. So at this point, from our sites alone, it's almost 10 projects that we've been doing it. And it worked well, and other sites have also been using this as well. So here is a snapshot of what has changed based on our adjustments. So the table that you're looking at is a similar table that I showed earlier, right? So the the risk rating, we didn't change much, so it's okay there. The risk factor, we keep it the same with some minor changes on the, what I call the process fluid interaction. And then the surface area, we didn't make any changes. So everything else that you see with the two symbols there is the, where the changes are made. And similarly, on the next slides here, Showing the calculation, we also made some adjustment to the weight, and then the range is end up the same, and then the breakdown into three different cutoff will be adjusted accordingly as well. So going very specific into each factor here, the first one in distance along the process stream. So the PPOP one is prov provided to you on the right hand side. On the left hand side is the no fee adjustment. So we make Overall, it's about the same, as you can see it's in the description or example way. We make it very clear from the beginning and end of the process step where it's considered one, three, five, or nine. So for example, for the the nine scoring here, it'll be in the final formulation steps all the way to the filling needles. And then for number five, any processing step after the last carrying step all the way to the final box storage. Okay. So on the next slide, it's showing the exposure temperature. So we make some adjustment to the time, uh, to the temperature on the lower end. So instead of minus, uh, less than two is less than one for us. And then for the for the three is one to 10. That's part, partly due to our own legacy practices internally on temperature ranges that we, we keep operating in. So it's easier to keep it using one to 10 instead of two to 10. And the next one would be the exposure duration. <clears throat> so here you can see almost changing the entire color from all one, three, five, and nine uh, boundary. So, so in our processes, we actually experience a lot of duration vari variation from very short contact time to very, very long contact time. The way you had in the people, we kind of skew towards the lower the shorter duration time. So everything longer than one week is generally high. So it kind of skewed for many applications. And based on our also internal data that we have performed study in the past, we were able to justify it for one score at less than one day, for long is greater than three months, for example. So so this is the most complicated uh, risk factor here when we talk about the final one for the, uh, basically, we call the process fluid interaction. So if you can see, on the, on the left-hand side, we updated the table to include pH across all the cutoffs, so it's very clear where we have them. And this is necessary because we have a lot of pH ranges in our production line. So we want to make sure we fully kept. Then if you look closely, you, real, you can see that the, <coughs> the TG for the polymer is actually not captured in our table. So we have to address it differently. And we will show you 
later on. So how you address from the TG standpoint of the polymer. So here what we do is we will leave, when you assess the, the scoring, we'll assume you are actually evaluating based on the flexible polymer per se. So you score them accordingly for a rigid uh, polymer. So at the end, we will adjust the score lower based on that initial assessment without complicating this example with the TG as well as other fluid matrix information in the same risk factor. So and then going down in the final calculation, so you can see that we changed the weight for the last four initially from the people was break down evenly. So we have to skew towards the duration time since we have a very wide range of uh, exposure duration from our production. And then we adjust the final risk level as well. So the low is 1 to 3.5, and then the medium risk is greater than 3.5 but less than 5.7. And anything of equal to 5.7 or higher is high risk for us. Okay. So here's some experience that we come across based on our exercise here. And just to point out so that you can watch out for those. So first and foremost, in terms of extractable data from supplier, we try to make use of them as much as we can. And we find it very useful for most buffer solutions. And we found that for the most part, they are, have limited application use where we have storage time at room temperature up beyond six months, so we have to potentially perform additional study to justify the longer storage duration. And at the same time, we need to really gather a lot of detailed subcomponent information before we can start our uh, assessment. And they're typically listed in the drawing. However, for the most part, it may not be detailed enough for you to capture that information. So they might tell you this is a silicon tubing, but then you may not know what type of material from who, where you can get the data from initially. So there's a lot of asking from a detail, to especially drill down to the secondary subcomponent supplier. And if they don't have extractable data, very often we have to perform our own. So it's really good upfront when we design a drawing to ask for that information upfront, where you have that information to perform your risk assessment. And at the same time, this is where you can get the, uh, the weather surface area and all these subcomponents to perform your, your calculation for the risk scoring. And based on a past study, when we need to qualify the component, our own, we typically have performed study in terms of surface area to volume ratio in the range of 2.5 to 5.5 centimeters square per mil. And in few cases, we actually go beyond that. It's almost like seven, but that's not a usual process uh, situation. It's more in the laboratory setup. So it's a pretty good match to the typical bioforum operation with six to one ratio. So the data is very applicable without any worry about adjusting the surface area volume ratio. In terms of the, the, the legacy practice I mentioned previously, so some of the small components could be surprises to us, which is found in several cases. And one of them is gasket. So typically, we don't expect that to be high risk. But very often, it could be end up high risk if they are actually in use during storage time. Uh, in certain situations where we have in the formulation tank, for example, where gaskets are involved, so you might expect that you get fuel within a day, but sometime in the operation there might be issues that you have to cut fuel and then roll that back into storage and then continue again. So in those situations where you have to capture the realistic worst case scenario. Um, similarly, in terms of filling line and needles, right, they're typically medium or low risk or high risk actually, but they do to mainly is low volume and more in that and they go right into your final packaging without any uh, uh, dilution, for example. 
And also in the case of line stoppage where you have to stop the line, and when you restart, you are not actually flushing it, then you just go fill right away, then your duration it could be longer than you expected. Last but not least, it's very important for you to, if you want to make adjustment to the risk model, so you based on science and your past knowledge that you have, and especially available data, if you do have any of those to help you justify that. Uh, and then when it comes to performing the risk assessment, it's actually pretty tedious work. If you think about it, across the entire process stream for a pretty, pretty much a disposable process a production line, you're going to have over 100, maybe close to 100 components or assemblies. In all this assembly, if you break it down in subcomponents, that give you another uh, 50, 60 plus subcomponents. So across the board, in a two by two matrix, it's a couple hundred components you're assessing. So it's quite laborious in terms of assessing each one of those. But then you, that's where you need the, all the subcomponent information. So somehow you can potentially simplify your, by grouping them based on the material construction. It would be best if you have some resin code so you can group them the same material type together so but without assuming they are actually identical. And then also have some process knowledge, knowing your process conditions so you can group those as well and to simplify your calculation. And this probably, once you start working on it, you slowly figure out some shortcuts and so on to make it easier. But at the, at the beginning and the first start, it's pretty laborious and tedious to set up the template. And then for us, you know, our uh, satelliting filter, if it's in scope, if you do leave them in scope, be aware that even though you have a risk level that you decide based on the risk scoring, it may not match the legacy practices or the expectation. Because currently, from submission, they all expect to have full data and qualification. So if you do include them, so just be aware that you might still have to do everything. And then last but not least, just be aware of the trap that you set up for yourself if you do worst case assumption approach to all your assessment. And this happened a lot because we, it's easier to certainly figure out a worst case and then apply that across the board. In some cases, you might, you might be simplifying your risk ranking in terms of subcomponent wise, you do assembly wise, right? So you have tubing, connector, um, filter, potentially bag, subconnector, port, everything into one full assessment using the worst case whichever components the worst case, you use that approach, then everything will be grouped as one and you have to qualify every single subcomponent into the same level. So that's something you have to be aware of. So in the last slide here, based on our experience so far, like I say, close to 10 projects here on the sites and more than that across the global sites. So we have applied this risk model in many different projects, in terms of uh, ex in terms of scope, so that include excipient manufacturing, like DLA one, for example, drug substance manufacturing, excipient and drug substance storage, formulation and fill in various batches sizes, and then it's also full range to cover all type of disposable component for small component like gasket, O-ring, and up to a large component like bags and filters. So, so far it performed as expected. So, the only challenge we are seeing is basically the storage time. So, you might limit your project team if you don't have the data to support longer duration. If they want production flexibility, they will potentially have to perform additional qualification and get the work done. So, all in all, Based on what we have done, we find that this is pretty robust and it works well for us so far. I think that's the end. Yeah. Thank you so much for everybody. Thank you, Dr. Wang.
Now, before I introduce our next presenter, Dr. Liu, once again, I would like to remind our viewers that there will be a live question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. And we will go through these at the end of the presentations. Now, please allow me to introduce our second speaker. Dr. Dejan Liu has been leading the Extractable and Leachables team at SGS Fairfield, New Jersey site since 2015 and leading SGS Global ENL program with ENL centers in Asia and Europe since 2017. She has extensive pharmaceutical industry experience with more than 200 ENL studies on a broad range of packaging systems, including process equipment, SUS, MUS, etc., pharmaceutical finished packaging, and medical devices. Before joining SGS, she was working at Fresnius Carby, leading ENL projects to support transfusion and infusion medical device and parental products. She has more than 10 years of experience on trace analysis by LC slash MS and GCMS. Dr. Dijan Liu obtained her PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Pittsburgh. She has authored more than 10 peer-reviewed journal publications with more than 300 citations. She has more than 20 international conference presentations as invited speakers and technical session chairs. She is serving as an expert reviewer for more than 10 prestigious journals in the field of analytical chemistry and pharmaceutical science. I will now be handing a Welcome, Dr. Liu. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Stu Jian. Uh, I'm the manager and the global lead for the SGS Life Science for Extractable Leachable Testing. So today I'm going to talk about the case studies and experience in extractable leachable testing process material. So can give a very nice presentation on the Sanofi's approach on the BPOC risk assessment model. So my presentation will cover a little bit on the risk assessment, but mainly focus on the testing experience. So in terms of process material, we can see from the picture, there are all type of plastic process material used during the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical manufacturing. So there are tubings, connectors used for solution transfer or transport, or there are all type of bags for mixing or reacting and also all type of uh, like storage container for raw material production, uh, reagent and processing intermediate, and all type of filters, gasket, diaphragm, all type of material. So those are mostly plastic material. So if we, you know, if we know from the traditional um, like pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical manufacturing, the, the bulky stainless steel equipment are traditionally used during those times. However, in recent years, the single-use system has been a popular measure for pharmaceutical and biologics production. I mean, uh, they are like disposed, they're disposable, so they are disposed after use rather than clean. So it can reduce the time and the cost for cleaning and also minimize the space requirement. However, it also increases the extractable leachable risk as most of the single-use system system, as we can see, are made of plastic. So here are some regulations regarding to extractable leachable testing on pl plastic uh, process material. So as Ken mentioned previously, the BPOC have some nice guidance, one published in 2017 about the best practice guide on evaluating leachable risk. And another one is published in 2014 for the standardized uh, extractable testing protocol. And the USP is also working on the draft um, on the extractable leachable testing for manufacturing components. So the first draft came out on the Pharmacopedia forum in 2016. They actually called 661.3 and 1661. And then in 2017, they actually changed the chapter name. Now it's called 665 and 1665. So they published the draft in 2017, and later on, early this year, they published another draft, like in early March, and open for public comments, which closed by the end of May, early this year. So uh, as Ken mentioned, for the BPOP uh, risk assessment model, 
uh, if you can see, you know, there you can do the risk assessment um, like as can describe in his presentation. And then once you get the risk score, you can determine which whether it's a low or median or high risk. So based on the risk level, you can determine what type of testing you need. Like for low risk, you only need to do the, the baseline companion testing. But for median risk, you need to perform the extractable data or some simulation data. But for high risk, you need to combat both the extractable and the legible testing. And the USP draft also mentioned uh, about the risk assessment, so which is have a similar uh, model in terms of risk assessment. So based on the risk, whether it's low, moderate, or high, we can perform all ty different type of testing. So in terms of uh, chemical testing, if it's a low risk, you only need to perform a baseline testing, which is we're using C3, that's a 15% ethanol water. Uh, we only perform the bulk property testing, like NVR, uh, the UV, and the pH. But for moderate risk of material, we need to perform um, the organic extractable profile, but only on the C3, which is the organic extraction, 15% ethanol water. And but if you have the material on high risk after risk assessment, we need to perform the full chemical testing, which USP was suggesting three solvents, C1, C2, and C3. That's acidic extraction at pH 3, and the alkaline extraction at pH 10. At pH 10 and organic extraction with the ethanol water one to one. So not only perform those baseline uh, low risk testing, we also need to get both organic extractable profile as well as the elemental impurity for the material. Um, if you are familiar with the BPOP guidance, so on the BPOP protocol published in 2014, they were actually proposing six extraction solvent instead of the three proposed by USP. So the six solvent are 50% FET, 5 molar sodium chloride, 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide, 0.1 molar phosphoric acid, and water for injection. So what are the difference between the BPOC solvent and the USP? So here shows a comparison um, compared to the BPOC versus USP. So you can see that both approach have one common solvent, which is 15% ethanol water. That's the common solvent in both, um, you know, protocol. And you can see the, the red one is proposed by USP, and the blue one is proposed by the BPOC. So in terms of the hydrophobic extracting solution, like uh, BPOC also proposed 1% polysorbate 80. The reason is it's the one of the common um, surfactant used during the biopharmaceutical manufacturing. But however, there has been some debate in industry because this solvent has some analytical challenges, which I can sh I will show later on in this presentation. But there has been studying to show the 50% ethanol can have the, the equivalent extracting ability as the 1% polysorbate 80. In terms of the acidic extraction, um, it actually shows the pH 3 salt, which is proposed by USP, and the 0.1 molar phosphoric acid can be considered interchangeable. So, I mean, 0.1% phosphoric acid does have a little bit lower pH, um, it's like around uh, 1 to 2, and the pH 3 is a little bit higher. So it depends on your process string. If it's very acidic, you may use the lower one. And the same thing with the alkaline extraction. So if you have a processed string with a pH more than 10, it's recommended to using the 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide. But if it's lower than 10, it's not necessary. You can use like a pH 10 buffer or something else. And for BPOC, there are also two additional extraction solvents, the water and the 5 molar sodium chloride. So it has been shown, actually, the water normally is, uh, doesn't really provide any additional information compared to the either the acidic or alkaline condition. And the fine molar sodium chloride, which can mimic the high salt, um, you know, like the high salt ionic strength in certain 
process flow, but it also has been shown with some challenges, which I will show in the next slide. So this shows the issue with the bimolar sodium chloride uh, with a high salt content. So, so this one can so this one can be an analytically challenging solution due to the high salt concentration. So the salt precipitate you can see from the picture, which we can see the salt precipitate out, and and also the I mean the all the lipophilic polymer additives that are very difficult to partition into the salt solution due to the salting effect. And so actually most of the time the phi Molar sodium chloride is considered as the weakest extraction solvent for organics, and then really provide additional information, which is already provided by some other solvent. Um, so that's for the sodium chloride. And for sodium hydroxide, which we show, so sodium hydroxide has some issue with certain materials. So like, uh, you know, for silicon tubing, it has been shown with some issue with sodium hydroxide. And we know silicon tubing are commonly used during pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical manufacturing. So it depends on the quality of the silicon tubing. So the silicon can be attacked on the surface by those hydroxy ionine during this uh, alkaline pH condition. So this can lead to a delamination of the surface and the particle, particles could form up and end up in the finished drug product. So as shown in the picture, which is the SEM image, you can see the damage area for the denamination. And in this case study, it's actually uh, uh, with the one molar sodium hydroxide to extract the silicon tube, tube at 40 and 15 degrees for seven days. And so we found a higher amount of Silicon from the ICP analysis, and also it's you know even after 1,000 dilution, it still saturated the detector, and also we found this denamination by the SEM. So so that's the issue with uh, sodium hydroxide with silicon tubing. Uh, for polysorbate, as I mentioned, it's also very analytical challenging solution, um, and. You can see from the picture, it generates a high analytical background noise, so it can prevent detect, detection of those trace amount extractable from those single-use material. Um, so, so, but the good news is the polystyrene 18 that has been studied to show can be simulated by ethanol water mixture for the extracting ability. Um, so, so it's actually you know. The, they have been studying to show the 15% ethanol can have this very similar extracting ability as 1.1% polysorbate 80. So that's the reason in the you know the USP approach they actually just proposing 15% ethanol instead of using polysorbate 80. Um, so here shows our um, extractable eligible studying flow for process material. So this. Flowchart is mainly for the high risk product. As we mentioned, we first do the risk assessment, we determine the risk, and then if it's high risk, we first need to perform a control extraction um, of individual process materials using the model solvent. And then, you know, we, we need to use a, perform a simulation study by using the drug formulation of placebo or the process flu. And then we do a toxicological evaluation on the extractable of simulation result, and then we select the target eligible, which may pose a safety risk to the patient. And then we develop and validate a method to monitor those eligibles in the final drug product. So this actually can be combined with the container closure ENL study. You can choose the target eligible from both process material and the final packaging, and we just combine all together and do a method addition in the final drug product. And then we perform a eligible testing on the final drug product, and we perform the final pathological evaluation. So this is the, the flow for the process material ENL study. And it has been shown there are some challenges we have seen with the ENL study on process material. 
So the, one of the challenges we have seen is to sometimes it can be difficult to design the extraction for the process material. The main reason is most of the process material are pretty complicated and mostly have like multi-component assembling as showing the picture can be tubing, collector, and the container all connect to each other as the multi-component assembly. And also, you know, we have seen during the process, it's mostly like a larger size, like nearly 100 or 500 liter, like for, for example, in terms of processing bag, it's normally a very big size. So when we perform the extraction study in the lab, it may not be that practical to use the large size. So you may want to have like a lab scale size. Um, so it is okay. So when you actually perform the study, it is okay to use the lab scale material as long as they have the same material as the, you know, the actual process, process material. And another thing we have seen is, you know, we need to calculate the surface area um, you know, because the recommended surface volume ratio uh, is more than six square centimeter per mil for extraction. So, but sometimes the process material can be have different shape. So it might be difficult to calculate surface area. So you might need to talk to the vendor or talk to the engineer to, you know, try to get the best calculation for the surface area. Sometimes we also do some estimate if it's an irregular shape we do an estimate for the surface area for the material. And so this shows an example in terms of extraction design for different type of process filter. So you can see on the top picture that's a pod filter. So we can use the housing to close on one end and fill in the solvent on the other end and then we close using the housing to close on the other end. And when we can put in the shaker, do the extraction. So similar approach for the capsule filter. So you can also use the housing to close one end, and then you add the extraction solvent, and you close on the other end and put in the shaker. And for like the filter we showed in the previous slide, like this is the cartridge filter. So the, for the cartridge filter, you can actually submerge in the extraction solvent directly. And sometimes we may require some dynamic extraction, which we can also use the dissolution device, you can actually hang the, um, you know, the, the cartridge filter in the dissolution device and perform a dyna dynamic extraction on those filters. Um, so that's for the example for filter extraction. And the other challenges we have seen is how to calculate the AET, which we call analytical evaluation threshold for process material. So the AET is a threshold which, you know, during the analysis, we may say tons of peaks, but we need to set a threshold. Only the substance above that threshold must be identified for safety evaluation. So that's the threshold related to the safety limit. So basically, we need to link to the tox limit to the analytical limit. So what tox limit should we use? Like this is the TTC, which is threshold of toxicological concern per ICHM-7 guidance for mutagenic impurities. So for this ICHM-7, so the TTC is actually based on the duration of treatment. You can see for short-term use, use 120 microgram per day. If it's one to 12 months, that's 20 microgram per day. One to 10 years, that's 10 microgram per day. If it's long-term use for more than 10 years, that's 1.5 microgram per day. And actually the duration of treatment so it's actually the accumulated dosing day, not like the time interval over the, the total, you know, time. Um, but what limit, I mean, but for, uh, like BPOC also have some guidance on the limits. You can see the genotox, we use 1.5, uh, which is actually in ICHM7 is for the long-term use. And then for sensitizer, that's five microgram per day. For general toxicity, it's 125 uh, microgram per day. Actually, more recently, they were using 50 microgram per day for systematic and the general toxicity limit. Um, so we were wondering, like, uh, what limit should we use? Because we have so many, you know, tox limit we can use for AET calculation. So right now, for like inhalation product, it's recommended to use 0.15 microgram per day. 
Um, but for other rot of administration, we it's better to use 1.5 microgram per day. For short-term use, it's possible we can use the QT of 5 microgram per day for irritant sensitizer. The reason is, you know, for mutagenic impurity, if you go with the ICGM7, actually at the short-term use, they go with a higher limit than 5. So, so that's the reason 5 is the lowest for short-term use. And so recently there has been some pushback from FDA by using the ICGM7 for AET calculation. So it used to be acceptable a couple of years ago by using ICGM7 for AET calculation, but now has been pushed back uh, from FDA using ICGM7, especially for short-term use. Uh, it should at, at least be using 5 microgram per day, not go all the way to like 120 for short-term use. But right now, for medical device, ICGM7 is still acceptable uh, for, you know, in terms of calculating AET. Um, so, so when we calculate the AET, process AET, so basically we need to link the process AET to the patient exposure. So the thing is we, so that's the reason we need to calculate the final container AET first. So we need to get the, you know, using the TTC microgram per day, we apply the dosage information and we can calculate microgram per container. And so with the fuel volume, we can calculate microgram per mil for the final container AET. And for the process AET, basically we need to convert by using the dilution factors during the manufacturing process. And also we may have different uh, extraction surface volume ratio during the extraction and the surface volume ratio in the process. So we need to do a conversion on that to bring back the AET to the process AET. So that's for the AET calculation. And, and another challenge we have seen is actually for the uh, testing. So for testing, normally we see complicated extractable profile for process material because they used all type of material. You can see this is the table from the USP 1665 draft. It has been shown some of the common process component, actually a very a various type of material can be used for all type of like filter, tubing, connector, or containers. So this jet can generate a very complicated extractable profile. So it's very, you know, it's, it's necessary. You need a state-of-the-art analytical equipment, for example, high resolution mass spec for the extractable leachable testing for process material. So this is our like a testing um, flow we have. So in our lab, that's the instrument in our lab. So we have uh, the Headspace GC with the high resolution, coped with high resolution MS to detect volatile organic profile for the VOCs. And also we have direct injection GC uh, with the high resolution mass spec to detect semi volatile organic profile. And we have the UPLC coped with the high resolution mass spec for non volatile organic profile. We also use the ICPMS for elemental impurities. So we perform the full testing for um, from the volatile, semi volatile, non volatile organic profile, as well as uh, elemental impurity for all the process material. So um, so here's and here's also a small case study, which is extractable study on a plastic bioprocessing bag. So as shown in the picture. This process bag is actually only 500 mil, but during the actual process, it's 50 to 100 liters during the actual process. So we perform uh, extraction with different extraction solvent, pH 3, pH 9, ethanol water, IPA water, to bracket the pH and hydrophobicity for common process flue. And the bag was filled with those extraction solvent individually, in the shaker, we put it at 14 degrees for seven days. And then later on, the extract solution was analyzed by Headspace GCMS, direct injection TCMS, and the LCMS. So during the Headspace GCMS analysis, so for one or compound, we found cyclohexanol, which is a common bonding solvent used to bond, you know, all the pods with the bag. So it was showing all the extract for cyclohexanol. And interestingly, we also found the IPA was shown in all the aqueous extract. 
Um, so we were wondering, I mean, we don't think IPA is a residual solvent from the, you know, from the back. Um, so we were wondering where this IPA comes from. So we actually sus suspect there might be a migration of IPA through the plastic bags. So our hypothesis is the because we have the IPA water extract in the extraction uh, along with other, you know, pH 3, pH 9 extraction. So we will suspect it's possible the IPA in the IPA water extract in the plastic bag is actually the IPA can penetrate through the plastic bag get into the gas phase of the shaker, and then penetrate through the plastic bag and get into the aqueous extract in other bags. We did the investigation study. So basically, we separate the incubation of the bag with the aqueous extraction and the IPA water extract. So in that way, actually, we didn't find any IPAs. So it confirmed our hypothesis is actually due to the migration. The IPA is a false positive result. But that means, you know, in the future to prevent this false positive result, we need to separate all the extraction, which is not that efficient to perform like multiple extraction. So we did another uh, study. We kind of, we, we wrap the plastic bag with aluminum foil. So we still put them in the same shaker. So in that way, actually, the minimum minimum IPA was found in that way. So it's actually that can be a good approach to to minimize this migration of IPA through plastic bag. So and then during the um, the LC uh, MS analysis, uh, we so you can see we we did using the ESI uh, source we found I the high amount of DHP, which is a common plasticizer. And also we have two, uh, a couple of other compounds. There are two compounds in that at uh, 21.7 and 23 minutes. So both of them, if you look at the iron, we have 405, 422, 427, which is corresponding to the M plus hydrogen, M plus ammonia, and M plus sodium. So we know the molecular weight is 402. And, and uh, based on the high resolution aqua mass data, we were able to determine the chemical composition is C24H136O5. So, so the two compounds actually have exactly the same uh, chemical composition, but we know they elute at different times, so that means they are two different compounds. So then we run the MSMS, we were able to get their fragmentation pattern, it actually looks different. So based on their fragmentation pattern and the high-resolution high acromass data for those fragments, we were able to determine the structure, the different structure for the two different compounds. Um, so in summary, in this presentation, we were talking about the recent uh, regulation update on the ENL study on process material from both USP and BPOC approach. So uh, in terms of risk assessment model, which can cover more on the risk assessment, and I was talking about like the comparison between the standardized extractable extraction protocol between the USP and the BPOG, and also some you know common challenges we have seen during ENL study of the process material uh, can be challenges on design the extraction, uh, can be challenges on calculate the AET for process material, and also, you know, it can be complicated ex extractive profile, which you need a high rest acromast to do the confident ID. And I saw a, a small interesting case study on the extractable study on the bioprocessing bag. So uh, at last, so SGS is worth, I would say, the largest uh, um, testing company. So we are a leading inspection, verification, testing, and certification company. We have more than almost we have more than nineteen seven thousand employees, which is almost one hundred thousand employees worldwide, and more than twenty six offices and labs around the world. So in terms of extractable electrical testing, we have a global expert network with more than ten years of experience on ENL testing. So I have my contact information here. If you have any question on the 
slides um, or you know on testing needs, feel free to contact me. And let's move on to the Q and A session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, as she just mentioned, we will begin the question and answer segment of the webinar. But once again, I would like to remind the audience that you can still send your questions in via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. So now our first question, and it's for Dr. Wong, and it's how is the BPOG risk model different from USP1665 risk model? Uh, okay. So in, so in general, risk assessment in, you know, on a higher level, you you have the freedom to choose what risk model to use, or even the risk assessment type model. So the one that we are showing here, as well as the one in USP, are not the common what you might know as SMEA model. This is more the risk ranking type model. So I have seen those SMEA models that some other company have used as well. So you are free to choose. Um, I haven't seen any regulatory agency questioning why you do it this way versus the other way. So that's that's the first part. And then once you decided the model that you want to use, you can adjust them based on your internal needs. So for example, if you are just a manufacturing site where you will only do from uh, filling, for example, your contract man filling operation, you don't have any upstream process, you can simplify the risk model just for your process steps that you get involved in. And vice versa, if you never do formulation fill at your location, you always uh, transfer it out to another facility, you can also adjust those as well. So those uh, those freedoms are there for you to choose and there's no right and wrong answer here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is, is the BPOG risk model accepted by health authorities? Maybe that be for you again, okay. Yeah, so I guess I have to answer it indirectly. So first and foremost, the, the document that we have published is shared with the agency already. They have seen it. Now, agency doesn't come out and openly endorse any recommendation or general practice approach. So the only thing I can say is that other than Sanofi, there are other companies also incorporated this into their own internal practice, and there's no issue so far, as well as when we were preparing the recommendation of which model We've done a kind of a benchmarking across nine member company using a common processes and see how they rank based on other risk models from the individual member companies. So all in all, we see a pretty good consistency across the industry where if you say for a given component in the same processing condition, you should rank in between other high and medium or low and medium, come across a situation where one will say high, the other one will say low, a completely extreme opposite. So if it's just a medium and high or low and medium, there's just some minor differences there because some, as you see, there's a cutoff. That's just because maybe that calculation is on the higher end versus the other model is on the lower end, for example. So it kind of in a gray area in those, in those situations. So if you are not exactly the same, it's not an issue. So, so in short, you know, through our own submission and so on and, and inspections, we never get challenged and I haven't heard of any issue from other company as well. Thank you. Moving on, our next question is how to select extraction solvents for extractable studies of processed materials. Is it necessary to use the model solvents recommended by BBOG and USP? And that question is for you, Dr. Liu. Okay, I think that's a very good question. So as I show in my presentation, there are a couple of model solvents proposed, uh, recommended by BPOG and the USP. Um, so, so, I mean, if for, for, for example, like for supplier, if you don't have the detailed application, uh, it's good to go with those model solvents because it's kind of have a broad range to cover all type of application. Um, but if you actually know your application, you have your, you know, you know your formulation, your process flow, you can actually just using model solvent as long as it can cover your actual process flow or drug formulation. So it's not necessarily to use exactly the same as the model solvent recommended by BPOC or USP. 
as well uh, as long as you can cover in terms of the pH and hydrophobicity for your process brew and and the and the you know formulation. Thank you. Our next question is: Can we only perform a simulation study of the process materials using the final formulation? And again, that's for you, Dr. Liu. That, that's also a very good question. So, I mean, sometimes you can say, oh, maybe we don't even need to do the model solving. We just do a simulation study by using the final formulation, which is the actual, you know, condition actually used. Uh, possible, we can do that because uh, it's actually in your actual use. But sometimes there a challenge is the, you know, the some of the final formulation of the process flu has certain surfactant has certain excipients which can interfere with the trace analysis because where when we do the EML study, is this is the trace amount of organic compound we can detect. So if you have a high background from the final formulation, it may have interference with your actual testing. Thank you. Our next question is how to perform the legible study for process materials. Uh, one more for you, Dr. Liu. Uh, so, for, to perform the leachable testing, as I show um, in in my you know the flow, the the flow which we first we we do the extractable uh, simulation study, we try to find the target leachable, and then we can you know target those compounds, put and we can validate the method to target those compounds in the final leachable study. Which sometimes we combine. We do the one leachable study. We can combine the target leachable from both the process material as well as the container closure system. So we can perform the leachable testing only on the, you know, the low stability sample. And actually, in the stability program, it's actually the T0. The T0 is a good uh, sample leachable sample for pro material leachable because the T0 is just out from the process haven't gone through the stability program yet. So that can be a good like sample for leachable testing. So once we validate the method and we are testing, you know, the uh, those target leachable in the final product, in those T0 sample, that can be used as a leachable testing for process material. Thank you. Our next question is if neither the risk model from BPOG nor the USP 1665 are mandatory, how should end users make use of these informations? And that's for you, Dr. Wong. Yes, so so all the regulatory agency has you know embraced the approach where you should take a risk-based risk, risk -based approach, which means you have to perform some sort of risk assessment. You don't have to use the exact same model as in the USP or the BioForum, but you have to have your own somehow. And if you don't, those are the two examples you can start to incorporate into your own practices as a starting point. Thank you. And so, it's, yeah, it's not mandatory. So basically, it's for example, and then if you find it useful, that's where you can adopt them. Thank you. Great. Our next question. Uh, for Again, for Dr. Wong, how did you rationalize the changes in weight factors in risk ratings you implemented towards the authorities? Okay. So, so the first thing I, I want to say, based on my experience and those in other companies that I come in contact with, I haven't seen any question from authority asking you why you perform your risk model and weighing factor this way or that way. They don't really question it like that. So but the challenge I see and I experience is mainly from your, your internal, especially your quality organization. So the goal is you are not designing a risk model where everything will come out one uniformly low risk, for example, so you don't do any testing. So you have to be more objective in terms of how you design it. So so that depends on the condition of use, that component could potentially be ranked low, medium, or high. You have equal chance of those. And you cannot be skewing your design that everything will be low risk or never high risk, for example, as one cases that I've seen in the past. So that's where your justification comes in. You have to convince them that your risk model is robust. 
you are not on, from the process from end to end. You you only see low and medium and never high risk cases. So that's the justification we have to provide based on our internal practices and internal data that we have showing them why we can score them this way or why this is actually lower risk based on our experience and our data set. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is, um, so it's two parts. Is there a supporting data um, for this risk-based model and how is the FDA accepting this risk-based model? Um, and again, that's for you, Dr. Wong. So I think this is similar to the previous one. Uh, again, uh, like I say, no agency have ever asked that so far. They leave it to you to perform the, the risk assessment and decide what risk model to use. Now, I, in, in inspection cases, I do see that we have to walk them through how we perform the risk assessment, but we don't have to justify why this and that. And we just have to explain to them so it makes sense in their mind that you are performing the risk-based approach. And the critis I mean, the biggest credit that you will face if you design this, like I say, is an internal stakeholder that you have to justify why you can do it this way and not that way, for example. So your quality stakeholder is your biggest um, party that you have to convince them. Moving on, our okay. next question is, there are many analytical techniques to be chosen for extractable and leachable analysis. Would you please uh, recommend the essential one and the optical one? Dr. Wong, would you like to start this question off? Yeah, so in, in the BPOP uh, best practice document, they have recommended the field that's actually presented by Dujan as well. So those are the Headspace GC, all right, Inject GC and LC and also ICP. We do have other listed in there, for, for example, non-volatile TOC, total organic carbon, sometimes pH, um, but they are not as critical. So those four that are listed and are mentioned by Eugen, those are what we consider the chemical characteristic type. So it's a quantitative in nature. And then the other is also quantitative, but it's not as useful as the, the other four. Um, I see optical, so I'm not sure if it's optical or optimum, but if it's optical, I think also Eugen has touched on the, the sim, which look at the surface. Now this is more qualitative than quantitative, uh, quantitative, so because you're looking at comparatively impact of the material, whether you get any degradation or potential incompatibility with the solvent. So do you have anything to add from your end? Yeah, I, I think Ken already answered pretty well. Uh, so, so the main, I mean, as I mentioned in the presentation, so the main technique we use is Headspace and direct injection GC, LCMS and the ITPMS. I mean, this is like, uh, you know, if you, you, you can really get the identification and the quantitation for the extractable profile. Like some bulk property testing, like NVR, UV, pH, is more like a general information. So it's not really you can tell, like, what really comes out. You can only get a very general information on the profile. So I think, as we mentioned, like USP, as you mentioned, for the Low risk uh, material, you may only go with the general property, um, but for the high risk or medium risk, you actually need to perform this, uh, get a detailed extractable profile by those four analytical techniques. Great, thank you both for your answers. Our next question is, can we get away with the risk assessment of the extractable data if extractables are well within the safety limits? without doing leachable study for the regulatory submission. Um, Dr. Wong, would you like to answer this first? Yeah, so, I, so first it depends how you set up your qualification requirement for your low, medium, and high risk. And in the USP have provided some guidance. So in general, yes, I have to say. So what people have done is that that requirement is typically applied to medium and high risk category of components where you will make sure you take the data that are relevant to your process condition. Um, we didn't touch on that today, but you know, you don't just, you don't just take any extractable data and just apply and think you, you, mix, you can use it. So you need to make sure that 
the data set is applicable to your specific condition, you bracketed your, your condition before you can use the data set. And once you use that, then you can evaluate based on the safety standpoint without you know, performing simulation study or literature study. Uh, at the same time, I just have to kind of put a warning out because this is not universally expressed by regulatory in terms of what they want to see, but I have seen cases where people or company get 43, and when they still the agency still requests literature study in some cases. So it's not consistently across the board, but in some few cases I've seen that requirement as well. Just be aware of it. Thank you. Um, Dijan, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Ken, and I think based on our experience, it's possible. You may get away uh, not doing vegetable if you have a very good risk assessment on the extractable data. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, the most conservative way is to perform both. But if you really have a good risk assessment on the extractable data, it's possible you can get away with the vegetable testing for submission. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just add a little bit. So in our case, if it's a high risk and under very specific condition, we will perform literature study. But anything less than that, we base on simulation data set that we previously have or extractable data set. So for majority of the qualification I have worked through in my past, we never have to perform study in only few occasions we have to actually do so. Thank you. Our next question is, would you advise to redo your risk assessment when you have done it according to UPS to do it according to BPOG? Dr. Wang. Or USP, I think. USP, okay. yeah, sorry, USP. Do apologize. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's an interesting question. First is no. And that was one of the comments that USP have received initially in the past is that when the risk model was in the 665, that means it's become mandatory. So the, the expert panel get a long list of comments and say you should not enforce a specific model for all company to use. And rightfully so, because a risk model is very specific, depends on what you make, right? A risk model for a bio, biotech company could be very different from a nutraceutical company or very different from a small molecule company. So those are just examples. And as far as whether you should redo it, one thing I could say, if you have embraced, you know, continuous improvement mindset and so on, you can always evaluate and see which one works better for you, whether you want to adjust or make changes to your own model or your own program. So that's what we have done internally for us. We've gone through our life cycle management of our ENL program, and one of them is to update the, the, the risk assessment model to harmonize it across the whole company. So this is something, a decision you have to make on your own. But it's not mandatory per se. Thank you. And Dr. Liu, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I think I agree with Ken. Yeah. Great. Our next question is, were there any trends or differences identified between the Sanofi and BPOC approaches such as the one process predicting potentially higher levels compared to the other, or one negating potential extractable solutions. For Dr. Wong. Uh, okay, so so within the the bioforum sub team, when we were looking at the risk model, we have done comparison between the two. Um, Overall, I have to say they are considered equivalent. It's just a matter of preferences. You like one model versus the other. So you might have one. We didn't see one that one will come out as low risk, the other is high risk in the extreme. As I point out, that would be a undesirable outcome. So if you see one as low, the other one as medium, that's still considered acceptable because there's a cutoff and where, depends on the cutoff point where you pick. One might go low and the other will go medium. So, and it's overall it's considered equivalent from our standpoint. Thank you. Our next question 
is uh, for uh, Dr. Liu. Do you run extractables and simulation study one after another, or run them both together? I think it's a very good question. So actually, it depends on case by case. So in some cases, we perform the extractable first, which we perform the control extraction on individual components. And the simulation, you can actually sometimes we can put a component together as an assembling to run the simulation study. So in that case, you can run one after another. And in that case, you can also, you know, in the, in the simulation study, you are more using the actual formulation of process flu. You can actually put some uh, kind of target compound or some, you know, kind of do a feasibility or testing the recovery of the method during the simulation study. And the other ways, you can also run together. Sometimes we do do that. I mean, we perform, I mean, just on the individual component, you can do like a model solver and plus the process flow and run the same study. We sometimes we also perform that. So it can be run both ways. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, were the bags with the IPAs labeled and could the IPA come from adhesive used for the labels? And I believe that's for you, Dr. Liu. Uh, yeah, I, I believe this is for the case study I presented. So, so the IPA is possible. Sometimes we can see IPA uh, from the back. Um, you know, we we do have we have seen IPAs ENL compound in the past. And by in this study, so one, once we separate the extraction from the IPA extract and the aqueous solution, we couldn't find any IPA coming out from those you know aqueous extract solution. So in this case, we don't believe IPA come out. So it's a false positive data. But uh, you know, for some materials, IPA can be extractable. Yeah, for sure. Great. Our next question. Which data acquisition mode is uh, recommended in GCMS analysis of targeted leachables? Um, full scan, EIC, SIM, or MRM? And can they use 10 UG day uh, instead of 1.5 UG a day to calculate AET of monoclonal antibody drugs. The customer is not supposed to take the drug a uh, lifelong time. Um, and I believe that will be for uh, you, Dr. Liu. Do you want to answer this first? Yeah, sh sure. I can answer first. So for in terms of uh, um, target digital testing, actually we normally for target digital we do a method validation. So if we do with the GCMS, it's based on the limit and the sensitivity. We may go with different scan. We can use full scan. Sometimes we use EIC, SIM, or MRM to reach a lower detection limit. And sometimes actually we just use FID if the limit is not that low. Actually FID in terms of quantitation is better for, for quantitation. Because for us, we actually run the GC. We have a splitter. We, we go through GC column and then go with the splitter. We run the MS and the FID at the same time. So we can correlate the uh, MS and the FID data. So I would say either we can, can do as long as we can reach the limit for the first question. For the second question, that's for the AET. You know, what, sh what should be the TTC or the SCT to use for AET calculation? As I cover in my presentation, so the, the 1.5 microgram per day is more general, used for non inhalation product. It's more general, like TTC to use. For 10 microgram per day, that's from the ICHM7 for mutagenic impurity um, compound. So, which, you know, 10 is uh, for less than 10 years, like 1 to 10 years, you use 10 microgram per day. The, the problem is that recently we have seen some pushback from FDA by using the SHM7 for you know a TTC. The problem with that is as I shown for sensitizer and the irritant, they go with five microgram per day, so they don't have a higher limit for shortened use. So that's the reason the five is lower than ten. So technically, if it's for shortened use, I would recommend using five, at least using five if you don't use 1.5. Um, for toxicological, for the threshold to detect compound for toxicological evaluation. 
Great. Our next question is um, it's for Dr. Wong. Is the proposed extractables test set up from uh, 2014 is quite comprehensive. Any chance that there'll be a revision of the extractable recommendation for test programs in the future? Um, yeah, there's something is in work right now in the collaboration with a lot of suppliers right now and end user. So there are two set of activities. One, actually three set of activities. One, we are looking at how the data need to be reported back to the end user. So we have a template developed and with some example and so on. So it's easy for us to make use of the information and it's consistent across all the suppliers. And that should be available for download very soon. The second one, we're looking into the, uh, the protocol and what we need to adjust based on available data we have and we analyze those. That is still in discussion for the larger team for agreement and so on. So potentially we'll be revising the document a little bit and then last is how the data will be shared among all the suppliers, sub-suppliers and so on, so that as an end user, you don't have to go through a lot of sequency agreement signature nonstop to just to get the data. So, so hopefully by the end of this year, early next year, we'll have a more comprehensive end-to-end -end solution available coming up as a final recommendation uh, on this. So stay tuned, I will say. And those information, when we have has it available, will be posted on the same link in my slide deck. You will see the reachable and also extractable portal where you can download all the different information, FAQ, uh, template inf information, and so on. Great, thank you. Our next question is, um, in your slide, Dr. Liu, um, you mentioned the surface area to volume ratio is greater than six, uh, six centimeter to uh, ml. Why the why is low ratio why is low ratio not good? Uh, so so yeah, I think it's my in my slide. So this is actually per BPOG and the USP recommendation. So for extractable study, they recommend to have a surface to water ratio more than six square centimeter per mil. Because uh, it's more like, uh, you know, when you have a higher surface to water ratio, you generate a worse case. So come, I mean, in the actual process, you normally have a lower surface to water ratio. So by doing this high surface to water ratio, you can generate a worst case scenario in terms of extractable profile. So that's the recommended the surface to water ratio per USP and the BPOG. Um, I know, I, I, I mean, I, but in the actual process, a lot of time it's lower than that. And also it's possible with some material, uh, it may not be able to reach that surface one and ratio. It can be some challenge to reach that as well. Yeah, may, can I add a few more things? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so in the, in the, in the bioforum recommendation, also in the USP as well, so for any component, you cannot reach six to one, you can justify it down. So it not, doesn't mean it's not, it's not good. And then the key thing I mentioned about, you know, you need to select the data set of extractable data set that are applicable to your application. And you need to make sure it's bracketed. So the six to ones is useful because you bracket almost all conditions. You will never exceed for the most part, unless in the very special cases. So that, that data set, a single data set is very useful across the board without you have to retest and regenerate the data. However, if you are performing the study yourself or your own process, you can just go to whatever surface area volume ratio based on your process need. You don't have to go to six to one. So it's a different reason why we go six to one for extractable data sets versus any simulation and reachable. You can go down to specifically for your particular application only. So there's two different angles, depends on how, what you are actually trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you both. Our next question is uh, for Dr. Liu. Are your analytical methods uh, validated to determine your detection and quantitation limits? Um, when determining the AET, is there any concerns of the method limits being below the detection limits, um, especially when method dilutions are required? So that, that's a very good question. So for, I mean, for as I mentioned, for target digital, so we perform method validation. So 
So for mass validation, I mean, we have the LQ, LD is part of the mass validation. So it's definitely covered in the analytical method. Um, I mean, for target reach ball, sometimes actually you can use some, uh, for example, as I mentioned in some previous question, we can use some sensitive method, which is using MIM, SIM, or using EIC, more selective you know, detection method to reach a lower detection limit uh, for lower AET. Um, but for screening, if you just do extractable screening method, so the method we don't call it, it's not a validated method because you don't have the target compound to look for. So we call it more like a qualified or semi-validated method. I mean, we still have detection limit, so we do run like a LOQ, LOD and to, to as a part of system suitability to look at the detection limit. And so it's still covered in the screening method, but it's not fully validated for the extractable screening method, but for digital method, it's uh, fully validated, so it's definitely part of the method. So for screening method, it, so that can be a tricky for like very low detection limit, because for screening method, you cannot really using any selective, uh, selective uh, detection method. So that will normally will try to use some sample prep procedure to to reach a better sensitivity for the method. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I believe that's all the questions we have time for. Um, but if you do have any extra questions, please send them um, to our emails, which I'll give air soon, and we'll get back to you shortly. Um, so thank you, audience members, for your questions. And before we finish the webinar, I'd like to ask our presenters, Dr. Wong and Dr. Liu, if you have any closing remarks for our audience. So Dr. Wong. Well, first of all, thank you for spending the time with us today. And we hope that the session here today will help you better understand the option that you have in terms of selecting the risk models and what example you can take from, and then the experience that we are sharing that you can be helpful for you. Thank you. And Dr. Liu, do you have any closing remarks for our audience? Yeah, I think same thing. Thank you all for your attention, for your time to join this webinar. Uh, I hope this, you know, material that the, we present are useful, are helpful for you. You actually learn something from the, the presentation. And I, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's a great pleasure for me to present uh, this webinar. And hopefully everyone can, everyone can learn something from the presentation. Uh, thank you both. And I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank our presenters, who were Ken Wong, Deputy Director at Sanofi Pasteur, and Dujon Liu, Manager of Global Lead Extractables and Leachables at SGS Life Sciences. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I would also like to remind our audience that you can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. And if you are watching this on demand, then please feel free to send your questions over to me at steephen dot edwards at biopharma hyphen asia dot com. I will get those answers sent back to you. Thank you everyone and have a great day. <laughs>